Hello, everyone, and welcome to California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, uh, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. This month, we continue a regional focus to our exploration of the development of the Golden States wine industry and its place on the world stage. Our host, Elaine, will speak with leading authorities in wine media, education, hospitality, and science to weigh in on the state of California wine and offer insights about general perceptions on the subject in their respective communities. These conversations will highlight the exchanges between California and the other great wine regions of the world, the common threads, as well as the varied approaches to viticulture and winemaking. Today, we have the great pleasure to welcome Oz Clark and Richard Siddle joining from the UK. So before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants, a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. The Q&A section is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar, and we will do our best to address your questions. But for those that are not answered live, we will provide a Q&A summary in the email you'll receive following the program. Now, I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American Specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vanitaly as one of the world's top wine communicators of the year for the last two years in a row. And I'd also like to introduce our panelists today. Oz Clark uh, has numerous wine writing awards to his name, both in the UK and the USA. In 2006, he won the prestigious International Wine and Spirit Competition International Drinks Communicator of the Year. And in 2009, the Louis Roederer International Wine Writers Award for his International Wine Book of the Year for his book, Bordeaux. Oz's frequent BBC TV and radio appearances are broadcast around the world. And in addition, he is an OBE, Officer, Officer of the Order of the British Empire for services to journalism and television. Richard Siddle is an award-winning business journalist and editor with over 25 years experience working across a number of fields, including drinks, computing, grocery retail, convenience, and travel. He now runs his own B2B website, thebuyer.net, aimed at the premium on trade and the wine and the drink supply chain that supports it. He was previously editor at Harper's Wine and Spirit for nearly 10 years. Richard has been particularly successful in championing the causes of small retailers and businesses across the different channels he has worked in. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie. Hello to both of you. Good Hi. morning. Good evening. Hi. I'm, I'm really excited about this and uh, excited for us to have more of a round table style discussion. But part of why I'm so thrilled is because I feel like we all three spend most of our time in wine and yet come at it from slightly different angles, each of us. So I feel like the in intersection um, of conversation we can have, I'm, I'm really looking forward to. So thank you for being here. That's great. Um, so I actually, Richard, I want to start with you. I, um, I would love to hear how you actually first heard about wine and first heard about California wine. Uh, well, for the purposes of this, uh, the, um, this seminar, it's kind the of polite, like... Yeah, the polite weird. version of the story. <laughs> yeah. well, it's kind of very weird to be uh, sharing this with us because um, as a sort of a teenager, I don't know, 14, 15 years of age, coming home from school uh, in the uh, sort of early, early 80s, my, my dad, who's an academic at Liverpool University, was very strict about what TV we could watch. So every, uh, every week we'd get the, uh, the Radio Times, which is like our kind of weekly booklet of what was on TV. And he would go through each day and he would circle opera on a Sunday night or he'd opera David Attenborough on a Sunday evening, all the things that we were intellectually and uh, st stimulators and, and educators. And uh, anyway, on a, on a, was it, I think on Tuesday or a Wednesday at about eight o'clock, was BBC Food and Drink. And uh, th this was seen as part of our education. So 
I, I, we would sit down as a family and um, halfway through the show, this chap called Oz Clark would come along and uh, talk about wine. And uh, yeah, he just like, just, just sort of remember then blew me away with, with just his, his passion and his being able to pick out wines from all over the world just by tasting them. I was, it was, uh, yeah. And, and, and then sort of all these years later to sort of find myself in the same industry. And then I went, actually the look to come to California with Oz on a, on a great trip a few years ago. And then, uh, yeah, so, so it is a bit weird sort of being on this, um, on this session with him today. So, uh, well, thank, thanks. And that, Oz. <laughs> well, and that show was, um, Oz, I think you said it was, your food and wine show was actually prime time evening slot for 16 years in the UK. Yep. Prime which time, is, you used to get up to nine or 10 million viewers. Which is incredible, you know. So from a US perspective, the idea that a wine focused television show would be in prime viewing with, with millions of viewers, that's, that's really incredible. But your, your story about how you got introduced to wine and and California wine specifically goes back actually to a period I think people sometimes forget. You actually got started as an actor and were part of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, I certainly wasn't. I was an actor before then at university. Um, and my first trip to uh, America um, was with the Oxford Cambridge Shakespeare Company. And we turned up at JFK one terrible December night uh, and drove all the way to Madison, Wisconsin in a, in a, in a bus. Uh, and at Madison, Wisconsin, we decamped into 10, 20 foot of snow uh, and gave as you like it uh, to, to, the, uh, to the University of Wisconsin or Madison University students. And um, we thought we were good. They thought we were good. And they all dragged us up to this enormous great room on the top of one of the student dorms. And I remember, I have to say, walking in and thinking, what is that smell? What is, why is the, why is the air so muggy? Why can't I see anything? Why am I beginning to think I can't hold my balance? Um, the place was absolutely stiff with weed smoke. Um, but what they were doing, they had these flagons of deep red wine. And they said, you want some drink? And I said, yes, please. And this girl poured me a, a, a sort of pint of this red wine, I thought student wine is going to be filthy. She's given me too much, but I'll do it. And I put some of this stuff in my mouth and it was wonderfully full of fruit and juicy and tasting of plums and black cherry jam. And I just thought this is the most fantastic wine I've ever had. And I thought, is it expensive? She said, no, it's dirt cheap. It's the cheapest wine we can get. I said, what's it called? She said, it's called Gallo's Hearty Burgundy. And of course, years later, I realized that that Gallows Hardy Burgundy, people like Rocky Oli in Russian River were selling their Pinot yeah. Noir grapes. To, no, it's to, the great, the great secret. No one else would buy them. But it was basically full of Barbera and mm -hmm. full of Petit Syrah. And I have to say, I came back, back to England, um, so was st still half, half able to breathe properly after, after, after those uh, students in Madison. Yeah. Uh, and I, w I remember saying, cheap wine doesn't have to be filthy. In Europe, cheap wine was filthy. It was, we drank it as students because it was cheap. It was filthy. I said, America, America's got wonderful cheap wine. And I thought, isn't this as it should be? The land of the free, the land of opportunity is the first country in the world which says you can have really good everyday wine, affordable for everybody. And that's, that's what turned me on to the excitement of the new world. And I, I was back in, finally got to California when I was with the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, and um, Trevor Nunn had his birthday and we all went around to, a, to a, a Chinese restaurant. We were in Hollywood, playing Hollywood at the time. And Patrick Stewart said, oh, for God's sake, boy, uh, we need some wine. Go and find us some champagne. So I went out uh, looking for, he was, he was in the show, by the way. He didn't just turn up. He was in the show with me. Um, and I went around to a place called like, Greenblatt's, um, some name like that. Uh, and I said, have you got any champagne? And they said, yes. I said, how much is it? And I, they told me, I said, I'm not paying that. I said, have you got anything local? And he said, well, interesting. We, we, we've just got the first vintage from a new operation in California that's just started to make top quality sparkling wine. Schramsberg, their first vintage. And I took a, 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 an armful of the Blanc de Blanc and the Rosé back to the Chinese restaurant, uh, you know, for, for less money than I'd have had to pay for a couple of bottles of champagne. And we opened all these things up and, and we poured the glasses and we toasted Trevor. And 
it was a wonderful moment because everybody just fell silent because they simply couldn't believe how wonderful the wine was. And that's, that's the time I first came across um, the attempt to be great in California. Uh, and so I, in a way, my first two uh, uh, visions of California wine were the bottom and the top. And California was superb at both of them. Yeah, no, thank you. And I want to just make sure everyone caught that that a key moment of the story was that you were drinking Shramsburg with Patrick Stewart, as, I, in, as in Jean-Luc Picard, of course, uh, my, my favorite of his roles. But, um, yeah. but the thing is, too, like the truth is Gallo deserves a lot of credit, a lot of the really... Um, just now iconic um, family owned, you know, older vineyards of Napa and Sonoma, they were saved because Gallo was buying that fruit and working with the growers in order to create Hardy Burgundy. And I think, I think now a lot of people haven't had Hardy Burgundy. And so they forget actually the quality of that wine was quite, was quite high as, for, you know, for, for what we would assume a less expensive wine would be. And, um, and they had really incredible vineyards involved and, and actually saved a lot, of, a lot of those old family farms because they were using the fruit for that wine. They gave, they gave them contracts, which nobody else would. And also that was, I mean, you know, one never underestimate the gallows. Um, they saw the way the wind was blowing and they'd been making all their money out of uh, Night Train Express and Thunderbird and all that stuff. They, they felt the wind changing. Yeah. And of course, the gallows, they, they knew Napa and Sonoma, Back, back to front, they, 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 you know, that was part of their world. And I think they, they thought two things. A, we're all in this together, so we'll give them long-term contracts. I doubt if they paid very much money, but they did pay something. Um, but they also said the, the world is changing towards table wine. So let's make something really drinkable. Mm -hmm. As in the last 10 years, they've, they've massively reinvented themselves, not only with their, their, big, their big sort of commercial brands, but all so with they're quietly buying and taking over and often improving very good estates in the central coast, in Napa and Sonoma. Um, they, they go into places they don't, if, when they take on a proper estate, they seem to actually take it pretty seriously. Yes. Well, and I think like the point you're making too, about that, that forward thinking, you know, the business side and forward thinking, it's really quite important. It's really easy for us wine lovers to be quite precious about wine. Yeah. But the truth is that, for wine to survive, we have to have market leaders and, and entry level products that draw attention, get people started, get people interested. And for the last few generations, Hardy Burgundy was really part of that. Mm. But you know, Richard, I mean, the, the thing that I think is really quite special about the work that you do is you're, um, you know, you're working really directly with with the trade side of the industry there in the UK. And you do a lot of sit down round tables with buyers, with sommeliers, and really see sort of where things are headed from that business side, you know? Um, and, and so I'm really curious, you know, like talking about that forward thinking view uh, of the wine business, you know, what kinds of changes are you seeing evolve there in the UK? But you, you know, you of course have global perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the interesting thing from the way we look at it from the sort of business press side of things, as opposed to like, we're probably more interested about how um, the wine ends up on someone's wine list or ends up on, on a retailer shelf is, is that whole process. So, I mean, my website is called The Buyer. I mean, it, it took a long time trying to think of the right word for, the, for, for it. And um, in a way, The Buyer kind of sums it up, really, because producers are, are trying to convince a importer to buy their wine. And then an importer is trying to convince a, a retailer or a sommelier or a restaurateur to buy their wine. So in a way, it's all about selling and buying in the same way that any, any industry works. Um, I, think, I think looking at California in, in particular, um, the, the, the kind of the perception, I suppose, of California, uh, I, would, I would say from the UK has changed dramatically in the, in the last sort of five, five years, possibly even less than that. I think um, I think a lot of buyers kind of switched off from California. I think a lot of the kind of the the, the drive towards Parker and the drive towards Points and the the kind of wines that are very suited to the domestic market just weren't hitting the palates that European or UK buyers and consumers were looking for. So all the what now people talk about in California, all they're sort of fresh, there's fruit, the the high acidities, the lower alcohols, the lower intervention all those styles of wine were being made 
um, you know, were, were being made increasingly in places like South Africa and Australia, uh, Chile, even Argentina to some extent. And so buyers have plenty of the new world for them to go to, 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 in the end of the day, they wanted to hit price points. They want to serve consumers who are looking for those kind of fresh, uh, approachable, easy drinking, have another glass type wines. And they weren't finding them from California. So they went everywhere else to look for them. And I think what we're finding now with California is that um, slowly but surely, you know, because the palate, I suppose, in America has changed. A lot of the consumers in America have, are also, uh, from what I understand, um, looking, uh, are also similarly, similarly minded, that um, a lot of those buyers have now or are now kind of waking up a little bit more to the wines that are being made in California. So it's very much, the way I look at it, it's very much um, the winemaking styles is one thing, but then you have the buyer and the consumer mm -hmm. palate how all that that kind of supply chain works yeah and it's yeah and there's a big inner it's i mean that's an important point to make it's a huge international shift and you know oz i was looking back recently at your um book red and white which came out relatively recently about maybe five years ago something like that oh, no, last year and oh was it it was that recent excuse me and so anyway i was rereading your california section my friend david strato was kind enough to remind me about it. And one of the things I love about your writing, there's a, um, there's a way in which even your writing feels jovial and, and it's such an inviting sort of tone for, for a reader so that it's, it's so readable for more than just a wine aficionado. There's just this kind of jovial, inviting sort of tone that makes wine seem like so much fun, which I think we need more of, you know. But, when, but you were talking about this same sort of change um, that Richard was just describing. Of, um, you know, California kind of went into a riper phase but, um, and has, as we've said, come, come into kind of a fresher focus. And I think really, in some ways, like we have the broadest range of styles to find right now in California that we've ever had, you know, like there's the greatest range of potential styles to locate. But, but in talking with the two of you to prepare for today, you know, I asked if both of you would select a wine that, you know, we can talk about these changing styles as we just did. And yet at the same time, there's been some producers that have just kind of been stalwart and, and held their place and, and really taken us through all the other changes. And I asked if, you know, the two of you could kind of think about that and pick, pick a producer you thought represented that. And right away, um, the first wine you mentioned was Ramy Chardonnay. And so I was wondering if each of you could speak to, you know, what is it about this wine? How does it represent that sort of holding your line um, and, and um, the kind of longer term vision that California has also had, even in the midst of these changes? Uh, shall I go, Richard, firstly, because... I'm extremely yeah, keen to get a mouthful of it. This <laughs> wine, yes. everybody. This is the great <laughs> Rémy Chardonnay. Uh, and this is the Russian River. I'm going to put. You're going to see this being poured. A decent slug of it at this time of day in the UK. Uh, I I think that um, one of the things we might forget about about um, California is that they sort of invented Chardonnay. We think Australia invented Chardonnay, but actually um, it was people right back. I mean, it, it, it may be back to people like Kendall Jackson, Vintners Reserve. I think if you, you, you think of which was the first rock star Chardonnay, was it sort of Rosemount from um, uh, Australia? Or was it Kendall Jackson's Vintners Reserve? It might have been Kendall Jackson's Vintners Reserve. Was it Jed Steele used to make it? And I remember um, Jess Jackson getting terribly upset when, when Jed Steele left Kendall Jackson. You're taking the secret away with me. You're taking the secret. I mean, there was no secret, really. Cool climate fruit with a few grams of sugar in it and, and keep it clean and keep it fresh and, and shove the odd bit of, 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 of oak in. It wasn't a big secret. It just somebody decided this is how to make a really good commercial wine. Um, now, that that style, I think that, interesting enough, I think that Kendall Jackson uh, Vintners Reserve is back on form again. I think it's the best it's been for some years at the moment. Um, but, of course, what that led to was people always in California. It's the same. We can do better. We can do better. That was, in a way, that was one of the great problems with California about the ripeness thing, because they kept saying, hey, but we can get even riper. And, and the old timers in Europe said, I don't think you want to do that. They said, yeah, of course, we could, we could let it hang. We could let it hang. We could make 16%. We can make 17%. 
Why would you want to? Well, they did because they could. And unfortunately, they were strongly supported by one or two rather overpowerful critics at the time. Um, and, that, and that also is much less evident now than it was even a short time ago. But there were a few guys who I think quietly thought, what are the best Chardonnays in the world? They seem to be Mersos. They seem to be Polunia Morachies. They seem to be caught on Charlemagne's. And they thought, we can do that. And the, but to do that, you don't need to just get the same barrels and get the same grapes and get the same vinification methods. You need a vision of flavor. And that's why I love Ramey's wines. Yeah. He's got a vision of what he feels is the most beautiful, savory, refreshing, long-lasting, memorable way to express Chardonnay, uh, not only in his Russian River, but in his single vineyard stuff as well. And uh, I think of, 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 of California white wines, it's, it's almost the first one I would pick um, year by year by year. And he hasn't let me down in what, 20 years? And I doubt if he ever will. Well, and the thing, um, my understanding, you know, looking back at old wine books, that one of the things that Kendall Jackson's Vintners Reserve did that, that was new at the time was they hit a mid-tier price point. There was really inexpensive wine, like jug wine, and then there was like more expensive wine. And yep. Vintners Reserve came in kind of more like an $8, $10, which and is... It of Chardonnay. It didn't yeah, of Chardonnay, yeah. Complete. Yeah, and that, and that cool. it created a new kind of price tier for, yeah. for wine that where it's like, this is good wine, but it doesn't have to be your most expensive wine, you know, and, yeah. and that really had a significant impact. And, and, and I agree with you. I th it's a really solid drinkable wine. It's perhaps a little drier than it was um, yeah. in the beginning, but. Um, the acid's up a bit. But the, but like <laughs> Ramey too, like he, you know, he kind of started his career from the very beginning, really devoted to Chardonnay and taking it seriously. And his work, um, really researching best, best techniques actually influenced producers around the world and had a strong impact on Australia, especially. But Richard, you were about to. Yeah, no, I just think that this wine, it's just kind of classic, you know, California. I think, I think when, when kind of, well, California, you know, has done well over the years is, is create these sort of benchmarks that, that, that both the buyer and consumers kind of sort of recognize what classic California is. And I think classic Chardonnay from California done in this style um, is what, you know, all the great steak restaurants, all the great um, premium restaurants have on their lists because they know that if they, if they have customers who are looking for, it's, it kind of reminds me of almost like that sort of, um, you know, comfort blanket when you sort of like Sunday afternoon and you want to watch a movie, which it just takes you takes you away from everything. And I don't know, The Graduates or Butch Cassidy or something. And, just, and the Sundance Kid or something. There's, the, there's that kind of wine. It kind of reminds me of just uh, you just know what you're going to get. You can just like ooze back into it again. And um, I mean, clearly the stars have adapted and changed. And you know, they're, they're not as oaky and as, as and as full on buttery as they they may have been. Well, not, not necessarily Remy, but California Chardonnay in general. Um, but if you talk to the big, big, um, you know, the main importers in the UK who are, who are buying premium Californian wine, and they all say, you know, they've got to have, you know, it's the Chardonnay that, you know, outside of Cabernet Sauvignon and the big nappers, it's, it's the Chardonnay that the, the, the private, private clients want to buy. It's, it just works every time. And I think this, this wine is, is wonderful, you know. I, don't think, I think quite a lot of people still do want that rich style. But my last trip to California a couple of years ago, uh, it was very interesting talking to Ramey, but also talking to the Carneros guys and some of the other Russian River guys. And they were talking more about acidity. They were talking a little bit more about savoriness. And, and I did I remember that about six, seven years ago saying to them, you know, these are a bit round and a bit rich for me. I, I said, we'd like a little bit more of that sort of sense of terroir in your wines. And they looked at me and said, that is terroir. That is our mm. terroir. And of course you thought, yeah, because you're not selling to, to, to London. You're not selling to Frankfurt and Paris. You're selling to Chicago and Detroit and, and Philadelphia. And that's the terroir that they want. I remember talking to Nicholas Catena down in Argentina. We were saying to him, any chance of you having slightly lighter bottles and slightly less oak and slightly less extraction? And he said, OK, he said, he said, how much do you buy of my wine in Europe? And I said, I don't know. And he said, five to 10 percent. He said, how much do they buy in Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, Chicago, New York and Los Angeles? And I said, 90 percent. He said, 90 percent. Right, he said, yeah. 
that's what they like. In other words, that is the terroir. And, it, and I, my last trip to California, I felt, I felt that the winemakers, um, you know, terroir is whatever you make it to be. I mean, terroir is an interpretation. And I think they were changing the interpretation. And I, to my mind, this Ramey is, is as full as I could possibly want it to be. Um, indeed, it's one of this, this 2017 is one of his slightly full of vintages. Um, I've, made, I've had them drier and a little more f focused than this. I think the wine is fabulous, but I would personally age it another six, seven years. But it, it seems to me, and I think the Kendall Jackson thing is a really good example. I think that some of the kind of big brands coming out of St. Lucia Highlands and Monterey and the Sa Santa Maria, those, those affordable um, um, but big brands coming out of there, they're all showing the same thing. They ha there is a market for a slightly lighter style, a slightly drier style, lots of flavor. I don't want to go into that miserable sort of thin, mean, sulfurous stuff that we were getting hit with about seven or eight years ago in the name of Burgundian and in the name of mineral. But I think there's some really interesting stuff. Central Coast is producing a lot of affordable, really drinkable wine at the moment. Well, and I want, I do want to say that like tasting the, this Ramey Russian river, like this is, you know, so this is his regional Chardonnay. And of course he does uh, plenty, you know, multiple single vineyard Chardonnays as well. And the, um, the thing that impresses me about this wine is like you said, it has this savory element. So it gets your palate going. You want, you, you know, you want food, you want to revisit the wine and it, but it all, it has respectable flavor. There's plenty of flavor there but it's this like pure fresh fruit with this savory underbelly and this line drive of acid, you know? So my mouth keeps kind of watering and cleansing itself and, and yet I'm getting flavor to hold on to at the same time. And I think hitting that combo with something like, with something like California Chardonnay is, you know, it's thrilling. And this is a, you know, in today's standards, this is a reasonable, price point too and for, as you said this is, called, this, this is his big volume one yeah and this is his regional level and and you know and yet it's also incredibly ageable as you pointed out oh, you know and so and well and, and the, and the waxiness and the the oatmealiness and that sense of those hazelnuts to come here and maybe there's a little bit of that sort of croissant um sort of flaky croissant toastiness all to come this yes. i mean this wine has I've been open for 12 hours now and it is distinctly more exciting than when I opened it just uh, just uh, 12 15 hours ago and it's uh, I think it's uh, I think he's one of those guys that I would any any country in the world if somebody said hey show me a good uh, glass of, of really thought through vision Chardonnay I'd, I'd say Ramey's the man mm -hmm. well and so speaking to the central coast you know moving a little bit south in terms of you know we talked about what are what are things that have been around you know been in California for a while but that um, we think deserve more attention than they've gotten. And we, you know, the three of us ended up selecting um, Birkino Grenache as an example of that. And so um, this is actually worth pulling the map up just to help clarify where we're talking about, because um, the vineyard is in this interesting location that's just exactly outside um, the Santa Cruz Mountains. So if we see the big map, um, you can see that we're going to zoom into this very center coastal part of California. And so when we zoom in, we can see the location of the three wines. So the first wine, Russian, uh, the Ramey, is a Russian River Valley Chardonnay. So it's a blend of a few sites in the cooler parts of the Russian River there. Um, later, we're gonna, we'll talk about Lodi. But right now, we're turning to talking about Birkino Grenache. And a lot of the Birkino wines are from the Santa Cruz Mountains area. But you can see that Besson Vineyard is actually just exactly outside the AVA. And it's essentially just slightly too, too low in elevation and basically across the street from, from the Appalachian. But this is a really interesting um, part of the region because it, you know, there, it is, does still have mountain influence. It is quite close to a very cold pocket of, of California. And, but we're talking about Grenache here, which has been, been in California since you know, the late 1800s. It's one of the founding varieties of the state, but it isn't that talked about at the same time. I, 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 it's from the town of Gilroy. Mm -hmm. um, is and this is the Hecker Pass vineyard, from what I know. 
And there's two things about the town of Gilroy. Firstly, it is one of the smellier towns um, in California. It's not its own fault, um, but it is the garlic capital uh, of the world, probably, knowing all the, there's, there's, there's capitals of the world. Of, between Santa Cruz and Monterey, there's about 50 different vegetable capitals of the yes. world. Um, but the garlic capital of the world is, is Gilroy. And, of course, it's also home to uh, one of the most popular wines uh, in California, which no one has ever bought a second bottle of. And that is garlic wine. Uh, yeah, and I, didn't, I haven't garlic, bought a garlic first in bottle, a dish. to be honest. Sorry? I haven't bought a first bottle either, to be honest. <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm sorry, Elaine, you're not doing your duty. <laughs> you need to go down. I have bought a first bottle of it, and I love garlic. <laughs> and I would say that it is one of the most disgusting mouthfuls of wine I've ever had <laughs> in my life. And the last didn't time I didn't want to have it, it bes I, beside your spaghetti or anything. I, it's the, put the garlic in the spaghetti. There's nothing that could actually <laughs> cope with a mouthful of garlic wine. Nothing except possibly the almighty coming and saying, your time is up. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but as I drove up to the top of the Hecker Pass to drink that, I drove past the Besson Vineyard. And of course I thought, oh, that's Claude de Gilroy. That's Randall Graham's wonderful, wonderful Claude de Gilroy. And that's where he used to get that Grenache from. Um, and I went back after, you know, after having a life-saving treatment after the, the garlic wine. Um, I then went back and went down and visited the, the Besson Vineyard just as I said, I just, I just, you know, want to just walk in these vines, these wonderful, ancient, crabby old vines. 1910, they were, they were, um, they were planted. And, and it showed, uh, you know, houses all nearby, Hecker Pass, nice place to, to start building houses on the outside of Gilroy. And it really showed talking to, I suppose, Monsieur Besson, whatever the guy's name who owns it now. You know, he was saying, you know, we have we have trouble. We want to keep going. We like being winemakers, but what about our children? What about the next generation? Yeah. Uh, this is good farm. This is good housing land. Um, and I, I was interested. I think that the um, uh, the uh, the the Birichino. I call them Birichino, but I think they like being called Birichino. Um, I think what they're doing is fantastic. And 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 what Randall Graham used to do was fantastic as well. Um, sort of because it, by my reckoning, something between seven and ten percent of California's grape varieties are the sort of the unpopular ones, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ones the forgotten ones, the Grenaches, the Sansos, the Carignans, all these other sorts of things. Now that's an awful lot of grapes. And if people can start, and I know that, you know, Rand Randall tried hard with Clodagh Gilroy, but, you know, did, it struggled to make it, um, to make it sell particularly well. I always used to think it was one of his most exciting wines. But you then go there, you see 110 year old vines yeah. and, and the, the sheer delight of being in a vineyard with 110 year old vines. It's, it's thrilling. And there's quite a lot of it still in California. And I'm really grateful to these guys. And they look at, you know, they're out looking, you know, find us more of these things. Find us some Sanso, find us some Carignan, find us some Chenin. I think, I think what they do is important. Well, and it's one of the examples of, you know, again, um, wineries that have been around a while like Gallo, they, ma they were making wines that helped save some of these older vineyards. And then, you know, it's sort of a later generation, people like Randall Graham, they, you know, he had a different vision for California as well and, and kind of found, found these older vineyards and, and a way to use them in a different way. It's, and now, you know, Birichino continuing with the, like really finding these special spots and making wines like this. And Richard, like talk, Talk to us about like how, you know, how wine like this Grenache, you know, how is, what's its place in a, in a market like uh, London? You know, how is it being received by, by buyers there? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm almost like having a flashback here to being a teenager listening to Oz. I can, I, it's just like, you, you can go off on a whole, whole journey with him really. Um, in fact, you know, in fact, actually, Oz, I remember when we were traveling around California, he was as knowledgeable about everything that you, that you drove past as he was about the wines that you that you've just been to so be it the telephone mast be it the uh, the plumbing systems the drainage systems so um yeah that's, a, that's probably for another seminar um but in, in terms of this 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 style of of wine i think um yeah i think picking up on what, what oz says there you know the the, the the um there's definitely that interest from from the uk market and i think from international buyers um to to find what you might call classic European varieties and and how, and how they do in in other parts of the New World and I, and I suppose 
things like you know Grenache Sanso and you know the the the, the, the kind of the classic classic varieties that um, you know we we don't see as much of these kind of wines over in on our market than as perhaps we would like to. And I think when we go to tastings and we, and we can see the fact that this wine is you know, it's got sweet, savoury. It's thirteen and a half percent alcohol. It's you know it's it's for me it's like um, you know, it's light, it's refreshing. It's it's got all those characters going going for it. It's also got that elegance as well. And and I think they're perhaps not always the um, the, the, the descriptors a lot of buyers would expect when they when they're going to pick up a Grenache from California. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, I think that the challenge for California is to, is to make enough of these wines available in the international market. Cause I mean, obviously the volumes as, 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 uh, as, as Oz was saying, you know, a lot smaller, but, um, I think that's where in terms of like waving a flag or, or demonstrating what California is doing and has done for a, lo a long time, but, but a lot of these wines necessarily haven't been coming over over to our, our market. And I think, um, you know, when, when I was part of a, of a trip last, last autumn with a lot of UK buyers who went out to, to visit, and in fact, you, obviously you were on the same trip, and we, they tasted, you know, through, you know, 300 different wines from about 200 different producers. And, and a, lot of those, a lot of those buyers hadn't been to California for 10, 15 years. And, you know, and most of them were just blown away by the diversity and it is this kind of wine that yeah. they were talking about in the bar afterwards they were like going i just never expected to find this here and um it's that thing so of yeah, it, it, isn't it of, yeah. of balance of price um because uh if uh we we've got to pay the besson family enough for their for their old vines which won't be producing so much grapes so many grapes uh we've then got to play um Birichino enough for them to think it's worth uh, making. And yet we've got to sell it for an attractive enough price um, yeah. to, to, to make people think, yeah, California makes some really good value wines, uh, not cheap. I'm, I, I'm not asking any of these California wines to be cheap, but they've got to find a way of saying we are good value. And by the way, uh, if I think John, I, I think John Locke, I think that you're, you're in, out there somewhere. Did we meet for the first time in India when you had about two years full of wine stuck in the in the in the Omar Khayyam cellars in Maharashtra? Um, is I I think you you just cut your hair since then, but I I have a feeling that that's the first time we met in in India. You were making wine in India. Well, so John, uh, I know you are watching, and I'll just I'll just warn you that Oz is going around telling stories about about the two of you um, bumping into each other in India, and so you should be careful. Send him an email to clarify, because because uh, there's all kinds of crazy stories coming up. But the um, well, just but, on that comment about the value wine from yes, please. What, what, um, so I think um, for those from the trade watching this, um, what was really interesting from the from that buyer's trip. So, you know, we, you know, you had, I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying, you know, Steve Daniel from, from Hallgarten and Novum Wines, who was, who was the, the, the odd bins buyer back in the early 90s, who, you know, was responsible for bringing in Frog's Leap and so many, so, so many what became iconic wines in the UK market. And, um, you know, I remember a lot of the conversation was a lot of the wines that the American, sorry, the Californian uh, producers were presenting as like being their value wine was sort of between sort of 30 and 40 dollars right which is yeah whereas, whereas for the uk that that's just like yeah you know not what they would see as a value wine you know that, that's like you know by the, by the time you bring transportation logistics vat duty you know you, you that, that wine's going to be at least double double that in, in in pounds so um there's there's that aspect around as i says i think what what the uk market and i'm sure this is the same in 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 central europe as well is is um, to, to really make a lot of these wines work in international that, that producers are probably going to have to look at their margin. They're going to have to look at their price point and they're just not going to be able to get the same price as they can in America. And, they, and, they, and the wine, wineries that, that realize that and understand that can really make hay because they can get their foot in the door and then they can build, they can build a range, they can start with some wines and then they can introduce Yes. You know, used to like the Ramay Chardonnay as a sort of a, 
a kind of a, a benchmark and then they can build around that. Yeah. So, so rather than sort of seeing it as like, you know, here's what I, here's my price and I don't stick, don't move my price. You know, that, that kind of approach isn't really going to work in international markets who, in a way, California's well, it's not the naughty step, but it's still kind of on the, we still need to be convinced that a wine is there for a step. If it's such a, mm-hmm. <laughs> such a phrase. And, and I, I think also that um, there are two things that, that California can do. Firstly, make much better use of what is so-called bulk vineyards. Um, now, some of the ones in the St. Joachim may simply be t- too hot um, to be able to get really exciting flavors out of. And maybe th- there's enough bulk market um, necessity that nobody would need to, to, to deal with a lot of that stuff. But there are other areas um, at the top of the St. Joachim for a start, um, several places down the central coast where, frankly, there are... Vi- I mean, look at something like the San Bernabe Vineyard uh, out by King City. Uh, right, on right. the Salinas there. <laughs> I mean, it was, I, I'm t- I'm, I went there and they, I discovered they had an airfield in the middle of the vineyard and, and nobody knew it was there. Well, I, 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 did, I was drag racing in the middle of the St. Bernabe vineyard. It was 11 miles long or something. Um, and yet, when you look at that, you think, but hang on, this is actually in fairly decent um, vineyard conditions here. And it's yes, in the Salinas yeah, yeah. Valley and you've got a fair amount of stuff coming up from Monterey Bay. Uh, and you start thinking, if people want to, they can make very good um, affordable wine from those kind of places with big economies of scale. And I do think those, uh, again, going back to Central Coast, I do think Central Coast has got a great opportunity as they had 20, 30 years ago when all those guys were establishing. I remember people 30 years ago were going down the Central Coast and saying, this is, we're going to make, you know, $10 Chardonnay, sell it all over the world. Well, I, I can't honestly remember whether they did or they didn't, but they certainly could now. Uh, and the other thing is that that um, that we should consider to try and make uh, California affordable is there are enormous numbers of places uh, which don't have a famous appellation to them, but right, which can yeah, be entirely yeah. suitable to vines and which are cheap to buy. The trouble is with Napa and Sonoma and these places, you can't afford to buy stuff there. Um, if you're starting out, that's why it's lovely to see people like John um, using old stuff that is already around the central coast and crying out for someone to love it and make something of it. But there are loads of other places where you can say, okay, I can afford to buy 50 or hundred acres of this stuff. It's not in a wine area. It doesn't mean it's not good for wine. And California is full of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, most, most of the state turns out to be incredibly growable, you know, mm-hmm. so it's one of the benefits of California, but, but the Birikino, you know, to make a few last comments on it before we move into the third wine, you know, the thing that I think that Birikino is doing so nicely across all of their wines, but especially in this Grenache, you know, it has again that, that intersection of there is the honest fruit. You know, you have this wonderful fruit purity, fresh fruit purity, at the same time that you have a savory character that, that weds it so well to a meal and the acid to keep your mouth fresh, you know, so you have the kind of perfect three-part harmony that make that makes the wine so pleasant. And so it's, it's an honest California wine that respects what you need to put it alongside food um, at the yeah. same time. And I just, I think that that's the sweet spot, you know, like let's be real that we want some flavor and at the same time build the wine with its structure and savory components so that it can, it can marry itself to, to a host of different foods and meals and, and, and on its own at the same time. And not Fred yeah, about that, that, that's great. So good ones. Goodman Steakhouse or a gaucho in the UK with a steak, you know, you don't have to have a great big yeah. cap. You know, that's a lovely, you know, all those points you just made there, that elegance really for me. Yeah. And, of course, and it's nice. So, to, because it's they're nice so to, bulk grapes. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of them. In, there's obviously most of them French, but there's, there's a fair amount of bulk Italian grape stuff around from the Italian guys who planted. There's a certain amount of Spanish and Portuguese around, but there's a lot of so-called bulk Italian and French, which in Europe now, everyone is, is, is panting over. Old, old Carignan, right, old yeah. Luciano, you know, these are the kind of things that people long, leap after. And there's a significant minority, but a significant minority of, of the wine world now, which is saying, let's get something new. I remember about six or seven years ago, talking to 
two wine buyers. One was the co-op, big operation, very good big operation. And another one was probably someone like Marks and Spencer's, one of those big, good supermarket groups. And they both said the same thing. We've suddenly noticed this year that our consumers have become more adventurous. Which is great. Seven years yeah. ago, they suddenly become more adventurous. And one just thought, that's wonderful, because they're suddenly saying, OK, I've had, I've, I've, I like Sauvignon Blanc. Have you got anything else? I like Cabernet. Have you got anything yeah. else? And and that is an that is an area which I think that that uh, California's got a good chance if it if it makes use of of this seven to ten percent of it of, it, of the less popular grape varieties that it's got it's got a, a good chance in Europe uh, Northern Europe in general not just not just right Britain. yeah yeah Scandinavia has got really quite curious Ireland for, Scandinavia yeah. you know yeah. uh, Belgium Holland these sort of places all enthusiastic uh, wine countries, Poland, uh, you know, places which are actually, there's a, a younger generation of sommeliers, a younger generation of buyers, and obviously a younger generation of, of, of wine drinkers in places like Poland, brand new, um, who are absolutely up for these new experiences. Well, so let's go ahead and see the Birkino wine slide. Um, you can see, yeah, before we move into the third wine, but the Birkino also, it hits that kind of affordable price point that Richard, that you were mentioning, too, um, that it's it's maybe on the top end of the range that you were getting at, but um, but again, this is you know here in the state. A great value. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's a great value, and I think I, I want to comment too that the el finding elegance in in this Grenache is really it's lovely to see too, because the truth is that Grenache can also very easily go into a very alcoholic wine, and this is a nice example of how older vines, uh, you know, a, a sloped site and the right winemaker, when they all come together, you get, you do get elegance and Grenache and it's nice to see that here. Yeah. Um, and, and must be, Ellen, I wouldn't want it to be any less either. Right. I no, it's that perfect point. I to sell it for less money. Yeah. Oh yes, I agreed. We need that vineyard to keep there and we need Birakino to stay in business. <laughs> Amen. So let's, um, let's go ahead and though, you know, you're talking about some of the um, other parts of California and actually we should go ahead and look at the map again because we're talking about um, an area that I know all three of us actually have spent a good amount of time in and, and actually have, have talked about quite extensively and so we're actually going to into inland California a little bit. You can see Lodi there on the map. Katie's done such a nice job showing where it's located but one of the things I want to make sure and point out is that um, if we look at closely at this map Lodi is inland from the coastal mountains, but notice there that there's the giant bay complex. There's San Francisco Bay, which feeds into San Pablo Bay in the north, which then buds out into another multiple bays there are slightly inland and creates, it's a little bit hard to see in this map, but it actually, um, those bays intersect with the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. And the area that Katie's going in is actually a giant delta complex. The, it's called the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And it actually goes all the way into the western side of Lodi. And the reason that this matters is because that bay and delta complex actually creates an opening in the mountains that goes all the way from one of the coldest ocean currents in the world in the Pacific and gets pulled in a daily fashion all the way into Lodi. So there's um, this part of California has, you could almost think of it as the lungs and diaphragm of the state in that as temperatures increase in the Central Valley, it pulls cold air in from the ocean to fill in the gap. And that, that cold air coming in from the ocean actually pulls cold delta winds across Lodi every afternoon. And then in the evening, fog rolls in and cools the area down at night as well. And so people sometimes assume, oh, Lodi's located inland, it's quite hot, but actually this its location right there at the mouth of the bay and delta complex means that it's actually much cooler than people expect and has a genuine coastal influence even if it's not a coastal region and richard i know that lodi is an area of california that you've been quite excited about and really tried to get people to pay more attention to and i was hoping we could start this part of um, talking about the third wine way just hearing from you what is it about that area that that makes you so excited. Yeah, I, I just think uh, Lodi is sort of, um, of all the regions, I mean, I'm not, not at all uh, having to go, <laughs> go at any other part of California, but um, in terms of personality, in terms of the characters, 
and in terms of the people you you meet in Lodi and just the kind of the the, the warmth and the I don't know I, I I just think when I I've been there um, I've been fortunate to be there three times and each time I've been there it, it's just this great experience of because it's not as famous obviously as Napa and Sonoma um, you know, people, when you go on a wine trip, they're going, you know, what are we going to Lodi for? You know, why, why can't we spend more time in Napa? And yet when you go there, it's just this, this the personality. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's less ego. Everyone is it's just a lot more homely, homely. And uh, yeah, I, I, from, so, so from that point of view, I love it. I love, I love that kind of, um, I don't want to sort of necessarily the Walton style, but it's sort of like a little bit like that. But um, but then then the wines, I mean, you know, you've got everything there. From So for me, with my business, trade journalist hat on you know you obviously got a lot of bulk wine being made there so you got a lot of value wine and it's where when you talk to a lot of the big supermarket buyers and the big importers in the uk you know they're buying a lot they're buying wines that that have a lot of fruit from lodi so so they have that side of it um and then 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 there's a whole other aspect to it is where it's it's become um like this sort of very experimental area because obviously as Oz was Oz was referring to you earlier about the price of, of 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 land, you know, and obviously land is a little bit cheaper in Lodi, so there's there's more risk taking, I suppose, going on because there's there's there's, there's more there's, there's the, the ability to do that, and um, and then you have the old vines as well, so you have got all these different aspects to it, and I, and what I also feel about Lodi is that when you um, talk to wine winemakers in Napa you know, some of the really prestigious wineries in Napa and stuff, and they talk about what's in their, the, 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 what they make up of the fruit. And often they'll say, oh, 8%, 10% is Lodi fruit. But it's only because you kind of ask that question. Right, that right, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a little secret that it comes from Lodi. And, I, and in a way, I kind of like go, yes, great. <laughs> There's some Lodi in there. And um, I don't know, I've, I've, every time I've been there, I just had a really great time and I, and I didn't want to leave, you know. And um, so I always say, you know, once in California, you know, when you're doing trips, take people to Lodi, um, everything, everything's going on there. And, and as you say, the, the whole cool climate thing, that, that diaphragm is a great, great description because, um, yeah, when you go there, you, you can really, really, really see it. You know, you see the fog, you see the mist, you see, the, you see it lifting and everything. So, yeah, I love it. Yeah. I was Absolutely. there this... I was there at, I was um, there early in the year and it was actually so foggy that the, um, this is obviously pre COVID it was, um, end of February, but it was so foggy that we had to keep our windows rolled down. And every time we turned a corner, we would, we would honk the horn and yell <laughs> because it was so foggy. Yeah. Like the digit, you know, the field of vision was that small, but, um, you know, so the, the fog and coastal influence are, are quite real there. But, you know, Oz, when we were talking about the third wine, I asked both of you, I said, you know, let's pick, let's pick a third wine that is something we see emerging in California that we want to continue to grow and gain more attention. And, and so, you know, Oak Farm, and you mentioned their Barbera as well, but we went, we decided to select their, their Albarino. But, you know, talk to us, what is it about this wine? That well, they, that, that's a really important point, Elaine, because I, I believe that Lodi has more different grape varieties growing than anywhere else uh, in California. Yes, there's more um, than 120 grape varieties growing in Lodi, and it's the most diverse growing region in the state as far as that And goes. some of those are 100 years old. It's got, what, 40% of the Zinfandel, uh, and quite a lot of that is 100 years old and, and old head trained stuff, wonderful, gnarly, ugly old things uh, with producing beautiful fruit. Um, but a lot of it is um, Italian stuff. Uh, that's where the Spanish stuff is. That's where the Tariga Nacionals and the, and the Portuguese stuff is. Um, the, 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 the mixture of soil, good sandy soil run down from, uh, from uh, um, uh, the, the Sierra Nevadas. And I, so agree about this this Sacramento Delta, Delta thing. When I drive over there, I love it because when you get into the Sacramento Delta and you you actually have to there's a traffic jam to wait for a ship 
to go up to Sacramento, <laughs> which is above you. And you're, and you're in the, the levees and the, the road goes out. You think, this levee is going to break. This levee, I'm, I'm going to be drowned. I'm going to be drowned. It's an area absolutely seething with the maritime influence. And uh, uh, by the way, Clarksburg, I think, is another area which is absolutely ripe for, for um, California to make more use of. But it's this wonderful thing of, of the age that, that Rich, uh, Richard was talking about. The people over there, the, the, there's a real sense of, of farming. Uh, there's a real sense of tradition. There's a real sense of, of friendship. But there's yeah. also a real, uh, a real French, uh, sense of, of we can actually produce lots of stuff quite cheap because we're actually only a few miles from the top of the St. Joachim Valley. It's just that we've got that magic of the, of the Delta breezes. We've got that magic of the fog, but we've also got the economy of scale. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I first came across Lodo with old Joel Peterson's um, Zinfandels mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, because I, couldn't believe how how wonderful they were and the number of times i did blind tastings and again and again it was a lodi either a lodi county or a lodi single block single vineyard wine i thought this lodi stuff i was like you richard i kept thinking i must get out to lodi i must get out to lodi it took me a while to get there and i i must admit that now to to look at something like albarino being grown there shows how flexible and adaptable lodi can be it's it's a it's a farming community. If they say you know, Albarino is getting popular in, in in Europe. They've they've started planting it in Australia. They started planting it in New Zealand. Why not us? Sure, why not us? Put in twenty acres, um, and 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 because uh, nobody's got any sense of hey, Lodi has to be Cabernet or Lodi has to be Chardonnay. Lodi doesn't have to be anything. Uh, Lodi can be whatever it wants, and I and I think that it's a. Uh, I think it's one of the great commercial, high-quality um, vineyard areas of the world. It's the I have to say though, too, tasting this, you know, this Albarino is really a kind of a go-to show-off wine for me. I've been able to use it um, in seminars around the states and also um, in multiple countries in the world, and it's it consistently shows well. And the thing that I really appreciate about it is that it has it has depth, it has complexity. Albarino can be incredibly simple. Um, and this, yeah. you know, this is very drinkable, yet it also has, there's, there are layers to it, you know, and it's, um, Quite and so right. it makes me want to go back. And, and just as how um, Albarino has got massively better in Galicia, uh, in Northwest Spain in the last five years, and how it's massively improving in Northern Portugal from that slightly leaner style it used to have. Uh, this is is a real textbook Albarino. It's got it's got tremendous um, weight in the mouth, but it doesn't compromise in any way. It's freshness. It's lovely. It's bite. It's snap. And it's that that Albarino is famous in Europe now for saying that's your seafood wine. Well, here's another one, and I agree with you, Elaine. One or two of those earlier Albarinos were a little too soft. Um, I thought this is nice Albarino flavor, but it's just too soft. Good old Lodi comes up and says, "Hey, we don't we don't do too soft. We understand balance. This is balanced." Yeah, and it also reminds me of the Albarinos that we first well not first, but we were seeing in the UK market say two three years ago when they were sort of like more restaurant led and there were more food food they're coming from the restaurant scene, and then it moved into the off trade and then it's like become mass market off trade below eight pound type Albrinos. And I think that this reminds me of that, of that really richer style of Albrino, which um, you know, we, we, we were first getting recommended by sommeliers a few years ago. So that's yeah, great. And uh, actually a shout out to James Hocking in the UK for, for bringing it in. And, and James is uh, one of the, the great you know, UK importers who's been you know, championing California since he, well, well through, through all his career. But um, you know, that, 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 that in a way James is typical of the kind of the newer, style actually of um of uk importer of the who are smaller independents who are who are really seeing california as a place where they can go and source and as i was saying there's there's all kinds of wines in fact you know you were both saying you know, there's all kinds of wines to be made there and um and you know we, we, we are seeing you know some of the more exciting young independent independent uh, importers like wanderlust wine and nectar wines in the uk who who haven't been in the industry before and they've come in from other sectors but they're, but they've both 
sort of pinpointed California as being a place where they want to go and discover wine and that they're just finding more and more interesting things. And this is a great example of, the, of that kind of d- discovery that we're now getting in, in the UK. And maybe that's because I know James has been doing excellent stuff for years, but I think most of um, the approach to California over the last 15 to 20 years, has, with the exception of James and a few others, has probably been a bit lazy. Um, uh, and now uh, you're absolutely right. Nectar, Wanderlust, these are, these are new companies who are, who are finding new um, consumers. You know, Wanderlust doesn't go out and, and, and uh, say, hey, let's, where's the old consumer? I'll see if I can persuade them to like my wine. Wanderlust goes out and says, I know there's new consumers out there and I know how to find them and I'm going to give them new wine. And this is exactly the kind of thing that from, from California that they would like as well. I think that. Yeah, gets... and also, I think, oh, yeah, sorry. No, please, please, yeah. No, no, I was going to say, I think, think one of the great things about those kind of guys is because they haven't come from the industry, they've, they're not um, got any of the baggage of Parker and Points and, and all that. They, they literally are coming in from, you know, being from management consultant backgrounds or whatever. And, um, and they've, they've traveled to California on holiday, you know. And, and I think that's the great, great thing about what they're doing is there's this, this wonderful, because I think California sometimes should never forget you know it's just the best place to go on holiday you know yeah. everybody we're all in lockdown and you know we can't travel we, you know we can't come to california but you gotta you gotta, you know i took my kids to california a couple of years ago and had an amazing road trip and it's just you know it's experiences that you'll you'll never forget california hollywood you know the the, the pacific highways everything about it and the, the, these guys went out there with that literally wanderlust and um you know and they came back and they almost like started importing wine not by mistake, but more like, well, these are great wines. And then they've now connected themselves with all the, the, the hip, hip type winemakers, not because they, they knew they were hip, they just kind of gravitated towards them. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, wouldn't necessarily with, you know, what Oz was saying. I mean, I think some of the bigger distributors have, have had their eyes um, distracted to other parts of the world. And um, the, 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 the door has been left open, I think, in California for, mm. for, for, for the specialist merchants, independents in, in the UK, lots of like the retailers here all support California. So there's massive opportunity, you know, it's a, it's a really exciting, exciting time. And, um, you know, arguably California's best years are, are still ahead of it, you know? I, that's a good point, Richard, because I, I think that um, for better or for worse, uh, some of the big commercial brands have dominated um, our market from California in a way that even they didn't even do that from someone like Australia, um, but they really did from California. And, and it maybe made a, the audience think, Oh, well, so California is just about commercial wine. Uh, and, and B it, maybe it made people think, Oh, well, I won't bother with uh, trying to get lively and excited about California because it's dominated by big brands. Um, but I, I agree with you. Those a, that time that those big brands have got a, a place they're an important part of our uh, of our wine world, but it, things are changing. And funnily enough, the COVID thing that we've got at the moment, the 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 whole millennial crisis, the Brexit crisis, all these sort of things, a lot of people and uh, Richard at Wanderlust is a classic example of of dealing with this kind of business. Um, they're, they're sort of saying, oh God, you know, I'm, I'm I'm generation rent and I haven't got a mortgage and blah blah blah. But actually, I've got money in my pocket. And I want to spend this money now for me. And California is in a great place. Because what, the thing about California is if you actually um, remove some of the big brands for, for, from the, um, the, the, the picture, however good, they, however good business they are, California, the name California, the Golden West, everybody's <laughs> got a feeling about the Golden West. Everybody's seen the films. Everybody's listened to the rock music. Everybody's got a vision. And the new California, I absolutely agree with you. The next 10 years, if California sorts itself out, and, and the next 10 years can be a wonderful decade for California. Uh, and it's a decade which places like Napa Cabernet and Sonoma Chardonnay, they'll be fine. They'll go on making excellent wines. But I think that the, the, the really exciting decade is going to be all the ginger groups nibbling at the edge. And California is a big place with lots of edges to nibble at. Thank yeah. you. 
So we have actually gone over. I feel like we could just keep talking for the rest of the day, but we're actually out of time. And I feel like there's so a one, one quick, please, quick, quick last yes, comment. Please, yes. do. Only, only, only from the point of view of, um, so I've been fortunate to go on three different trips to California with, um, and uh, each time, you know, understandably, you get taken straight to the wine region and you get straight into getting the producers. But on my last trip, um, you know, my, my partner's from California and we, and we actually went to uh, Bodega Bay and, and uh, hung out there and we, we got a little cabin. And, um, and you know, you, and I've been, you know, for the week with you talking about this whole diaphragm and the cool effect and the maritime, you know, and okay, you, you, you see a bit of fog, but you don't, it's a bit cold, but you don't really kind of like sense it when you're, when you're out there, really. Um, and so I went, went, went there and tried, walked down to the beach and literally could not stand up. The wind was so yeah. mental. Yeah. It was like, I was like being hit by sand. The cabin shook all night. It was just crazy. And, 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 I, and I must say, every one to California trip should take people there first, go to the beach, experience that wind and then go to the wineries because then everything just can make, make sense. And it's on the back of that trip when I went there suddenly everything that you were saying and all the winemakers were saying about the, the, the maritime influence, it was like, my God, yeah, Christ, it's, it's, it's mental. So, yeah. Well, I think if people have only seen movies that feature LA, um, they assume all of California is warm and full of palm trees. But, but actually, no, we really mean it when we say there's a, you know, this is one of the coldest ocean currents in the world and it informs yeah. the weather across the whole state and actually big parts of the state are are quite cold. But I, I, you know, I, I just want to thank both of you for commenting on, I think where California is headed is incredibly exciting. And it's, it's what makes me want to do what I do with keeping up with everything. And my hope is that these conversations that this whole series has been having has ha, that they've helped not only educate what's already here in California, but also how much is growing in California and how much is more to come. There's so much excitement here. And, and I really appreciate both of you sharing, sharing your thoughts and especially your time. You're both incredibly busy people and it's, it's so fun to see both of you and so fun to have this time with you today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elaine. Have a nice day. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Oz. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so a recording of today's webinar will be published to the California Wine Institute's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And all of you participants will receive an email with that link. Uh, so remember, you can also access all of the previous Behind the Wines episodes on the YouTube channel. And we hope that you will join us next week for the final episode in September. Uh, because of the popularity of their first episode, taking a tour of California's diverse terroirs, geologist and terroir specialist Brenna Quigley and director of the UK's uh, Sager and Wild wine bar, Michael Sager, they will return for part two. Uh, the conversation will take place on Tuesday, September 29th at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thank you again. Wishing you all a great week. <laughs>